Uh, today's seminar is going to be given by uh, Jonas uh, Hawkinson, uh, Dr. Jonas Hawkinson uh, from um, the University of Colorado. Uh, Jonas did his PhD on the aerodynamics of bat flight um, at Lund University. Then he did a postdoc at the University of Southern Denmark on the aeroacoustics of uh, rodent communication. Right now, uh, Jonas is uh, doing his second postdoc at the University of Colorado and uh, researching bat flight in the context of uh, predator-prey interactions between bats and moth. Uh, today, Jonas uh, will be talking about uh, maneuvering uh, flight in bats. And just to note that Jonas is actually joining us at 6 a.m. to give this talk. So uh, well done and thank you for that. So there you go, Jonas, I'll give you the stage. All right. Thank you very much for that uh, for that introduction. And uh, yeah, let me just uh, get my slides up and going here. Reset my timer so I know how long I've been talking. And now I'm sharing my screen. I believe. Brilliant. Can everyone see it nicely? Excellent. Thank you. Okay, so yeah, hi, and uh, welcome to this uh, presentation on uh, maneuvering flight in uh, in bats in the context of uh, moth pursuit. And as Orly mentioned there, it is uh, it is rather early for me. So um, if I start yawning or uh, seem to get more lost than I should in my slides, then please excuse me. I'll uh, I'll blame the early time of the day. So. Uh, in this uh, presentation, I will uh, give a bit of an overview of the project I'm currently working on. And I'll talk a little bit about my background and how that relates to, but also differs from what I'm currently doing. And then I'll talk a bit about the methods I use in the current project I'm working on. And I'll also give you some, uh, some preliminary results um, although I'd, I prefer to say brand new results because that sounds a, a little bit more exciting. And let's start by looking at this video. So here we see a bat pursuing a moth completely in the wild. So the wider project I'm working on is about understanding how bats pursue moths. So what strategies they use for uh, for hunting and how these strategies are uh, limited and uh, informed by their aerodynamic performance. And I chose this uh, video here, maybe I can start it again, um, because it's, I think it highlights how um, exciting and also uh, aerodynamically challenging this behavior can be. So see, there's there's a lot of tight turns and twists and uh, this one happens to end with with a nice capture there where you see the bat uh, completely env env envelop the moth in its wings there and there are uh, three pis of this uh, project so there's uh, dr aaron corcoran uh, here at the university of colorado colorado springs where i work and there's dr hamid vaidani at uh, lawrence technological university and there's uh, Dr. Sharon Swartz uh, at the Brown University. And I like to view this uh, project as uh, composed of three integral parts. So on the one hand, we have a pursuit strategy. So the tactics the bats uh, use for catching moths. And then in the other end, we have uh, flight kinematics. So this is how the bats move their wings uh, while flying. And these two parts, they are uh, mostly tackled at, uh, at UCCS, that is uh, the acronym for the University of Colorado, Colorado Springs. Uh, so these two parts are mostly tackled at uh, Brown University and uh, University of Colorado, Colorado Springs. But the third part is uh, aerodynamic modeling. And this one, in a sense, connects the other two parts because from the, from the flight kinematics, uh, from how the bats uh, move their wings, we can predict the forces they produce uh, via this aerodynamic modeling. And then these forces that they produce, they they don't exactly uh, give the pursuit strategies, but they, they limit them and they uh, uh, inform them. I think of it a little bit as um, if you're trying to um, 
uh, figure out the best strategy for climbing a tree, that best strategy will differ depending on how strong your arms are. I, I hope that sort of makes sense. And in the same way, the best strategy for, uh, for a bat for uh, pursuing a moth will be limited by how, uh, how well it can produce the necessary uh, aerodynamic forces. And yeah, I uh, I work mostly on the flight kinematic uh, end of things, but I'll uh, also cover shortly uh, the other two parts in in these two uh, following slides. So I'm going to try and give a, a short and simple explanation of uh, sort of how the aerodynamic modeling uh, works. So we start with the positions of different key points on the wing of the bat as it flies. So uh, the different lines you're seeing here, they, they represent the trajectories of uh, different anatomical key points uh, on the uh, bat wing as it's flying. So for instance, we see the, the blue uh, line here that looks like a half circle when viewed from above. That is the way the wingtip moves. And then the um, uh, red one is the way the, the wrist area moves and, and so on. And from these uh, from these uh, positions, from these uh, trajectories of key points, we form a uh, a model of the bat. And then uh, the wings of this model uh, they are then separated into strips, uh, so little uh, mini rectangular wings. And based on how each little strip moves, so based on its velocity and uh, and its angle. Uh, you can calculate the uh, the forces that uh, they produce. So if we put all that together, we get the forces produced by the whole uh, wings. So to be clear, uh, this work is done by Dr. Hamid Vaidani. So he's uh, he's trying to teach me, but it's it's quite tricky. But I, I just wanted to give a little bit of a of a summary of that end of things. And then in the other end of things, we have pursuit strategies. So. By that, we, uh, we basically mean the mathematical models that best describe the way in which uh, bats uh, approach moths. So um, this part of the project is uh, led by Brown University PhD student, uh, Alberto Bortoni. And uh, I'll give you, uh, again, a bit of a simplified rundown of uh, what he's been up to. So. This is a figure uh, depicting simulations of three different ways in which uh, a bat can catch a moth. So again, we are looking at trajectories, uh, but instead of looking at trajectories of uh, anatomical points, we're looking at the trajectories of the, of the whole animals. So in the top here in, in blue, we have the moth trajectory. And then uh, in the um, uh, orange, green, and um, and purple. We have some simulated bat trajectories uh, according to different mathematical models of pursuit. And then here we see the um, uh, where the capture event happens. So these uh, differently colored rectangles they correspond to where, according to the simulation, the bat would actually catch the moth. And the three different uh, strategies uh, tested here are um, pure pursuit. So that's the orange one uh, denoted with PP. So it basically means that the bat simply steers towards where the moth is. And uh, I'd like you to note how this uh, results here in the, I'm gonna see if I can get a little laser pointer going. I hope you can see this. Uh, so you see how this uh, at the end of the pursuit results in the bat being behind the moth and chasing it from behind. And the other strategy is the proportional navigation. So this is where the bat keeps its prey at a constant bearing. And when um, when uh, when the moth is simply flying straight like th this, it results in the bat also following a straight line that intersects the path of the moth at some point. And the third model is a, is a mix of the two. So there's some uh, mathematical weighing of the two different models. And I, um, I, I won't tell you which of these three models best align with uh, observed bat pursuit, because uh, for that, you'll have to wait for the, for the paper to come out or uh, maybe invite uh, Alberto to give a presentation on his work. Okay, on to, um, 
to me and uh, a bit of my background. So uh, my name is uh, Jonas Håkansson. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the biology department at uh, UCCS. And here you can see my email and my uh, Twitter handle. Although I'm not 100% sure Twitter, Twitter will be there for that much longer. And <clears throat> so uh, I'll cover my background a little bit, uh, although you already heard it in the introduction. So uh, between 2012 and uh, 2017, plus some, some change, I did a PhD on bat flight at Lund University. And then I did a postdoc on uh, the mechanisms of rodent vocalization at the University of Southern Denmark. Um, followed by this postdoc I'm doing now, so bat flight, context of moth pursuit. And I'll also, I've also done a residency on the on using uh, artificial intelligence to track animal uh, behavior or movement at the Mathis Laboratory of uh, Adaptive Motor Control at uh, EPFL in uh, Switzerland. Uh, I did that this uh, this summer. So uh, I won't go into depth in all of these uh, different parts of my background, uh, but I will talk a little bit about what I did during my uh, PhD. So. Uh, I did my PhD at Lund University in southern Sweden on the aerodynamic performance of uh, bat flight. And I'll do a little bit of an aerodynamics introduction here, uh, at least the way we uh, studied aerodynamics uh, during my PhD. So uh, for starters, uh, I'd like to consider a Newton's third law that says that for every action, there is an equal and opposite um, uh, reaction. So I like to use this example of a hockey player, uh, where if uh, one hockey player pushes uh, the other one, uh, not only does he exert a force, but he also uh, is uh, affected by an opposite and uh, uh, equally strong force. And now for that to, to be more relevant, let's consider an airflow. So these uh, arrows here re represent air flowing in from the left. And if we put a wing or an airfoil in that airflow, uh, it will change direction. So this means that the airfoil has affected the air with a downward di directed force. It has, in, in a sense, um, sloppily expressed, uh, pushed the air down. And as it does so, the air in return pushes the airfoil or the animal or uh, plane it's uh, connected to upwards. So this is related to my research in Lund because how can we then observe this force? How can we measure it? Well, if there's smoke or fog in the air, then we can see it move, right? So that is what we did in the Lund University wind tunnel. So I still have my uh, pointer here. So uh, the Lund University wind tunnel is a big wind tunnel with uh, fans and stuff. Uh, and it's a really huge structure, but it's all made to create a nice even flow in this little region at the top. Here's a human being for size reference. So we run the wind tunnel and we uh, fill it with fog particles. And then in this little uh, test section, we have uh, an animal that is flying, typically at, uh, at a feeder with honey water or at an insect or something. And then we uh, shine a laser uh, sheet behind it. And then we have cameras focused on that laser sheet. And since there's smoke or fog in the air, these cameras can then, um, uh, with the help of these cameras, we can then calculate how the air moves. So, we do that very many times per second. So in the same way as um, as an MRI scan can form a hole from the slices, the, the error movement at each time point can be combined to give this time resolved sort of sausage of error movement behind the bat. We call it the wake uh, of, the, of the bat. So as you can see in my PhD, I focus very much on the error movement. I didn't look I mean, I did look at how the bat moved, but it wasn't it wasn't the main point. Uh, it wasn't the main way in which we calculated the forces the bats produced. For that, we observed the air directly uh, with this uh, technique that is uh, that's called a particle image velocity. Okay, that's uh, about enough about my uh, PhD, and 
I mentioned my, my background here uh, in part because of how it contrasts with my current research. So as I, as I said, I started with the wind tunnel studies. Then I went on to study the aeroacoustics of uh, rodent vocalizations at the, the University of Southern Denmark. So this was basically done by uh, excising rodent larynges and mounting them in um, in an advanced setup where we could control the the air pressure flowing the air the pressure of the air flowing through the rodent so we could sort of simulate a wing creating that uh, that pressure and then we could uh, control the configuration of the larynx to test um which different aeroacoustic models of sound production best aligned with uh, with what we saw um so uh, a, a little bit of a spoiler we found that the the rodents produce um high frequency vocalizations with a whistle mechanism and we tested a few different types of whistles and uh and settled on one that we found best describes that um uh, best best describes uh, the recordings but please note this little plus here after rodent uh, because I, I also worked on how another animal group produces sounds, um, but that uh, paper is currently under embargo, so I can't talk about it. But uh, keep an eye out for it uh, next week, because it's something that I will I think will um, be interesting to this uh, to this audience. And then after um, that, I did my uh, current I started my current postdoc in 2020. And uh, this summer, I did the uh, AI residency that I told you about at the uh, Mathis Laboratory of Adaptive Motor Control. And so, my current research it differs from my prior experience in uh, in one major way. All my prior experience was done in in labs, uh, but this uh, project is the first one where I feel more like a real biologist going out in in nature and observing animals. Uh, so uh, the current project um, is uh, the method is mainly about filming freely flying bats in Arizona. Uh, so this is uh, in uh, south uh, eastern Arizona at the border of uh, New Mexico, and it's at the Southwestern Research Station in uh, Cave Creek Ranch. So. This is an area that differs from the surrounding area because the surrounding area is a very flat and very much like a desert. But then there are these uh, so-called sky islands where there are uh, mountains, where there's regions of increased altitude. And these help form um, uh, regions with more uh, rain and so on. So it, it results in very lush, very biologically diverse regions with lots of different cool plants and a ton of different cool animals and very many species of bats. So um, our method consists of uh, raising mist nets where we then uh, catch uh, bats that we then have to uh, disentangle from the, uh, from the net. And uh, then we, for each batch bat that we catch, we determine its species to, for one thing, control if we uh, if it's one that we're allowed to catch, and then we take some morphological measurements that will be relevant later, such as the the wingspan, the area of the wings, and of course the mass of the of the bat. And then we have this huge flight tent where we uh, put the bats and uh, allow them to fly freely. So, and we also fill this tent with uh, a bunch of moths for the for the bats uh, to uh, to hunt. And I don't remember the numbers exactly, but it's quite a big region. You can see here to the right. I'm standing and uh, holding a big uh, checkerboard to calibrate a camera. And I'm about uh, 1.85 meters tall or six feet. So uh, just to give you some sense of the of the scale of the thing. So in essence, the work is done by releasing bats in this flight tent uh, with the moths in. And then in the tent, we have um, camera setups with several cameras. And with those cameras, we record the bats as they are flying. And since we have several cameras filming the same event, we can calibrate these cameras for 3D reconstruction. And um, 
yeah, it's a, it's a rather cozy process where you, you stay up all night, sit in front of computers with, uh, with a little trigger where you uh, click um, the moment something interesting happens. And uh, it looks uh, it looks a little bit like that, and uh, the resulting uh, the resulting data looks a little bit like this. All right, yeah, I I just love these videos we 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 get in this uh, work, but. Um, it is challenging, and it's uh, challenging um, in on one hand because bats are so very complex. They have, uh, if you consider the joints alone, they have more than twenty degrees of freedom per wing. And if you also consider that the the wing bones are very flexible, it's it's even more uh, complicated than that. And we solve this by, uh, as I mentioned, having multiple high speed cameras. So we try to view the bat from a couple of different angles because um, if for instance we only had uh, two cameras next to each other then there would be a lot of instances where the bat is completely covering itself with its wings and so on now this is still a problem but since we have uh, cameras around the bat uh, it's less of a problem than it uh, than it otherwise would be but this leads to um, this leads to other challenges because uh, with so many cameras and so many videos, uh, especially high speed cameras with very high frame rates, this results in very large volumes of data. So I think for the field season of uh, 2021, we had around a thousand flight events. So a, a thousand short triplets of, uh, of videos depicting a bat uh, doing a turn, doing some kind of maneuver or um, even catching moths uh, a lot of the time. And then in 2022, we had gotten better at this. So we got even more data. And a problem with this is that, so the trajectories I showed you earlier, the um, how the different wing uh, anatomical points on the wings move, they in the past have been manually digitized. So that means that uh, me or often some, some students would have to uh, manually click these, um, these points in, uh, in, in an application. And one event, uh, so a few seconds of flight can take one hour to fully digitize in three cameras. So we have more, uh, more, uh, more videos than we can uh, reasonably uh, digitize here. Uh, but to tackle this problem, we are using a method for automatic digitization. So we use uh, something called Deep Lab Cut, which is a software package for uh, animal pose estimation or um, automatic animal uh, tracking. So it's a deep learning based automatic pose estimation um, package uh, and it's written in Python. And the principle is that with a small amount of digitized data, you can then train a network or a computer model to continue doing similar digitizations. So here's an example video from their webpage where they've tracked uh, mice. I, th I think that that's mice. I think I don't think it's rats. So for for this video, uh, I assume that they've tracked, they've manually digitized a few frames of this sort of behavior, and then they've trained the model on it and then had the model automatically finish, uh, finish the rest or even finish other videos. And then, um, so yeah, Deep Lab Cut, it helps us automatically digitize the, the, the videos and to convert these uh, digitizations uh, from the different views. So three views in, uh, in our case, we use um, um, a MATLAB app called DLT DV for the 3D uh, reconstruction. So this was developed by Ty Hedricks at the University of, uh, of uh, North Carolina. And yeah, we, we use this for um, for some of the digitization that we do and for converting the, the um, automatic deep lab cut digitizations into 3D. 
So a, a bit of a, a disclaimer here. Um, I really like both Deep Lab Cut and DLT DV. Uh, I feel like I should mention this because Deep Lab Cut um, does automatic tracking, but it also does 3D reconstruction. And DLT DV actually also does some automatic tracking as well as 3D reconstruction. But for, for a few uh, historical reasons, we've ended up using both of these in conjunction. Uh, so uh, I just want you to be aware that any single instance of this, uh, so any one of these on their own could be a full solution. But in our case, we've opted to uh, use a combination of them. <laughs> was there a, a question or was just a, a noise? I think it was just a noise. That's ah, okay, okay, okay. And um, by doing this, by uh, by tracking the positions of the of the bats in each camera and then uh, converting it uh, to uh, 3D, we end up with uh, something that looks like this. So uh, yeah, here you can see how on each camera we have uh, uh, tracked the. Maybe I can can I run it again. Uh, we've tracked the, the points uh, on the bat as they move. And while looking at this, I thought I could have a, I thought I could hit play on the video again, can't I? Am I confused? Okay, I'll, I'll just go back and forward again to start the video. So, and as, as we look at this video and as this, uh, at this little 3D model of the bat, I, uh, I ask you to, um, to uh, remember uh, Dr. Hamid Vaidani and, uh, and the aerodynamic modeling. Because I think when I see these models, I see better how the, how the data that I'm gathering feeds into the uh, aerodynamic modeling. And uh, before we get to the, the, the brand new results, uh, I'd, I'll just like to cover a few uh, parameters that, uh, uh, that that will be important to have in mind while we look at the data. So first of all, we have the aspect ratio. So this is just the, the length of the wing uh, raised to two divided by the wing area. And this gives you a measure of how long and slender the wings are. So this uh, this albatross here um, that I I got the picture from Wikipedia. I forgot to put that in. Uh, this albatross here it has a very high aspect ratio because it has a long wing compared to the area of the wing, whereas uh, the crow has shorter um, wings that are, are a bit stubbier. And typically, you you say that the high aspect um, <clears throat> ratio wings are better for um, flying long or flying fast, whereas the, the shorter, stubborn ones are better for, um, for some uh, maneuvering. So based on this, we would expect a bat with shorter, stubborn wings to be uh, an expert at maneuvering flight, and whereas one with long, slender wings should be better at flying fast in open areas. And then we have the wing loading. So that is the the weight per uh, wing uh, area. So uh, it's supposed to say area, not R here. Um, <clears throat> so this is the amount of uh, of the bat's weight that each unit area of the wings support. And one important, um, one interesting um, um, consequence of that is that um, if you consider fixed wings, so an airplane, then the, the turn radius that you can achieve by performing a banked turn, the, the minimal uh, radius for that turn uh, is uh, dependent on, uh, is, um, it depends on this, uh, is proportional to, I'm sorry, it's, it's early, I forget my words. So this, um, the turn radius, the minimal turn radius achievable is proportional to this wing loading. Uh, for a, for a fixed wing, this is uh, a, a somewhat simplified uh, model of the whole thing. And and the turn radius is of course the the um, the radius of curvature. So it's just it's another way of saying uh, turn radius. So you know if you have a, if you have a small car, you typically have a, a small turn radius. You can perform a perform a turn very tightly. And if you have a a, a big Jeep or something, then your turns are typically wider. And uh, some uh, more 
parameters here are the the roll angle so that is the angle you achieve while performing a banked turn so that is when you uh, so when you fly forward the wings produce a, a lift force directed upward so if you then tilt to the side a bit that force vector vector also turns so in that way you can perform uh, perform a turn because the force vector vector that used to be pointed upward is now instead pointed um uh, to still upward but also to the side therefore providing you with a force for um for changing your direction we'll also uh, cover the flap angle so because for my for my nice illustration here that is the angle away from the um from the horizon between the tip of the wing and and the shoulder so uh, if a bat is is flying forward that is it would be the angle between the, the horizon and uh, um and the uh, line formed from the from the shoulder to the tip of the wing um in my case since i'm dealing with turning bats um it's instead the the angle between the the wing position at the middle of the downstroke, so that's when the wings are to be very straight, and uh, the um, the wing position at at other uh, faces. So over a wing bit, if we start with uh, with uh, the, the the downstroke, you'll see the the flap angle have a negative value, and then as we uh, get to the to the upstroke where the wing goes back up again, it will then increase in value and have a positive value until the wing reaches its top position. I hope that's not too too hard to, to follow. And then we'll also look at the wing extension or retraction. So that's the effective wing length. So if you uh, if, if the bat retracts it, if it bends its elbow and its, uh, its wrist a bit, it, it will have a shorter effective wing length. Okay, let's look at the, the three bats that I've started analyzing and that you will get some brand new data for. So we have Myotis auriculus, uh, shortened as uh, Meow. Uh, yeah, Meow, I guess. So this is a rather small bat uh, with um, a low aspect ratio and a low wing loading. I couldn't find the exact uh, numbers for its wing loading, but uh, looking at similar sized um, uh, bats, I'd, I'd classify it as, as as low for both aspect ratio and wing loading. And then we have the Coronarhinus taus endi, shortened as uh, Kodo, slightly bigger, and with um, um, uh, still a low aspect ratio, uh, but more of an intermediate um, uh, wing loading. And then we have uh, Tadareda brasiliensis, um, the, the taber. Uh, with a slightly higher mass and um, uh, a slightly smaller wing area, giving it a higher aspect ratio. So longer, more slender wings compared to the two other ones. And also quite a quite a big uh, wing loading compared to, to the other two. So we'll start by looking at um, the wing, um, the, the radius of curvature. Uh, plotted against the the roll angle for these uh, for these bats, so each uh, dot here um, represents a, a wing beat, and its um, its uh, vertical position uh, represents the roll angle during that wing beat, whereas the its um, uh, x position um, depicts its uh, radius of curvature. So what we see here, um, if we uh, don't mind these outliers too much is that the Meotis auriculus uh, typically has a, a, a lower roll angle than the other two, but um, is able to do tighter turns. Whereas the Tadareda brathliensis is at, at the top here with the, uh, a roll angle that steeply increases as the um, radius of curvature becomes smaller. So to make this a little bit more scientific and not just uh, ju not just look at some plots. I made uh, a bit of a prediction when I first plotted this, and my thinking is that since uh, overall Myotis auriculus and Cranorhinus townsendi perform less banked turns than uh, Tedaria uh, brasiliensis, something else must be going on for them to achieve these tight turns. So I'm I'm guessing that we will see 
a more asymmetrical wing movement. So an another way of turning is, of course, to produce different amounts of force with your two wings. Uh, imagine um, uh, at, at, if, you, if you think about a tank, uh, they have these weird, uh, I, I don't know what it's called, but these wheels with a band over them. And if you if you run these bands at uh, different speeds, uh, you will have the tank turning. So even though even though it can't turn like a, like a car by directing the the wheels, it can still turn by using an asymmetrical force production. So my guess is that something similar is going on for these for these bats here. And yeah, let's just quickly look at uh, this table again so that we remember. We have Myotis auriculus, uh, small, low aspect ratio, low wing loading. Crinorhinus tausendi, Kodo, a uh, little bit bigger, um, still low aspect ratio, but the wing loading is going up a bit. And then Tularida brasiliensis, a uh, little bigger, but um, uh, higher aspect ratio, more slender wings and higher wing loading. And these were our results and with my prediction there. So let's look at uh, the wing movements. So here I have plotted the, um, the flap angle of the inner and the outer wing. So the inner wing is in red. So that means that if you're performing a right turn, that would be the right wing and the outer wing is the, is the left wing if the, if the turn being performed is a right wing. Uh, and as you can see, uh, despite my earlier prediction, um, oh yeah, I should mention, and I've also divided this up into different uh, turn radius. So this is the, um, uh, the normalized flap angle over a couple of wing beats for turns with a turn radius between zero and one meter. And the second one here is... I'm I'm sorry, I, I, I couldn't hear any of that. What are we is Oh I think it's um Chuendu. Could you mute yourself please? Uh, I've tried to, but I can't think to mute you. <laughs> yeah, I can't mute either. Uh okay, so so not a question. Uh yeah, so the lower one is the same. It's the it's the flap angle of the uh, inner and the outer wing, inner in red, outer in blue, uh, but this time for a slightly less tight turn, so a turn radius of between one and three meters. And for both of these, they, they look rather symmetrical. Um, we have a slightly higher flap angle for the, for the outer wing at both uh, turn tightnesses. And then for Kodo, it still looks, um, and please note that for the, for the lower one there, that's only seven wing beats. So maybe take that figure with a, with a grain of salt. Uh, but for, for the top one, we don't see much difference. It's still rather symmetrical. We don't see a huge difference between the flap angle for the inner and outer wing. And this is actually more or less the same for Tadarada brasiliensis, but Note here how that we don't have so many tight turns, turned wing beats for Tadarida. So, yeah, what, what we're finding so far is that wing movement uh, in terms of flap angle seems to be rather symmetrical for all three bats. And we also see that uh, we don't have as many wing beats for tight turns for uh, Tadarida brasiliensis, and we don't have as many non tight turns for, for Kodo. So, that is sort of expected because Kodo is uh, a bat that typically flies rather slowly in a quite cluttered environment. So it would make sense that it performs tight turns. And it would make sense that uh, Tadarida brasiliensis performs less tight turns. And Myotis auriculus seems to just be more of a generalist. And in fact, it was uh, one of our favorite bats this field season because they just flew so well in the flight arena. Okay, moving on to the wing extension of the outer and inner wing. So remember my prediction. I predict that we will see less symmetrical wing movement from Myotis auriculus because it was able to perform uh, turns without banking as much, without rolling as much. So uh, I was sort of hoping that that would be what I saw, but it still looks rather symmetrical. It, it must be doing something else. 
so then I at least hoped that this would uh, be the case for the other two as well. But no, here, here I was wrong too. Now we are actually starting to see more asymmetrical wing movement. Uh, more pronounced for Tadarida brasiliensis, actually. So this is sort of expected a longer wing will produce more forces. And as we are seeing, typically the outer wing is more extended than the inner wing. Uh, unfortunately, this goes right against my little hypothesis that I formed here. So I will, um, I will have to uh, in the future look into more flight parameters to suss out uh, why it is that Myotis auriculus is performing its turns with a smaller roll angle than the, the other two. Excuse me, I'm just gonna get a sip of water here. Okay, just one last look at this turning graph. Uh, to remind us of uh, of, uh, of my failure here, where I made an erroneous um, uh, prediction of uh, what we would see when we looked at the movements of the individual wings. And yeah, that is uh, that concludes my my brand new uh, data. And um, there's more in the pipeline. So obviously, we're gonna uh, do this for more species and also more. Um, Flight inst more uh, flight events for the current species, and we will look at uh, additional kinematic parameters. Uh, in particular, we'd like to look at the, the angle of attack. So that's um, that's how the bats uh, angle their wings uh, against uh, the airflow. So um, typically, this will uh, to some point increase uh, lift production. So it can be. Uh, one way as well to uh, to achieve a um, um, an asymmetrical uh, force production that results in a turn. We we'll also look at the the stroke plane angle. So that is in essence the direction that the wing flaps in. So typically a more um, if if you think of a hummingbird, it basically flaps its wings back and forth as it hovers, right? So when you when you fly slowly, you flap more back and forth. But whereas you, if you fly fast, then you fly flap more up and down. So that's another um, mechanism by which you could achieve asymmetrical force production for turning. So we will look into that uh, as well uh, moving forward. And then, as I mentioned, this this data is to be fed into an aerodynamic model so that we. Won't, will not only get these um, somewhat qualitative uh, descriptions of the wing movement, but actually get um, the, the corresponding force predictions. And with this, in a combination with um, the pursuit strategy work that's been going on at Brown, um, we aim to arrive at a very holistic description of uh, turning flight and especially turning flight in the context of a, of a moth pursuit. And here are the references, and you can pause in the future recording uh, to read those. And I'd like to uh, thank um, uh, Dr. Sharon Swartz and her PhD students, Alberto Bertoni and Brooke Quinn uh, over at Brown. Uh, they've, they're both, uh, they've all been invaluable during the field seasons and um, yeah, just um, awesome researchers and good friends. And then in my own lab, we have uh, here pictured, we have our master students, Shans Rankin and Seda Agababian, uh, as well as uh, my PI, Professor Dr. Aaron J. Corcoran, and uh, see me here in the middle, and our undergraduate student and current uh, lab worker, Abigail Schultz. And not pictured in the in this photo are uh, our current undergraduate students working on this, uh, Seth uh, Jacobson and Chris Joyner, who uh, have been uh, invaluable. Um, all our undergraduate students have been great for uh, digitizing videos uh, so that we can train these uh, computer models to uh, to do the rest of the digi digitization. And I'd uh, also like to thank uh, Dr. Hamid Vaidani at Lawrence Technological University, who's been a, a really good uh, resource when you have uh, math questions. And of course, Jeff Bender at the Southwestern Research Station.
And yeah, just to remind you, my I'm Jonas Håkansson. Uh, here's my Twitter handle and my uh, email address. And uh, I welcome you to uh, contact me if uh, if you're uh, curious about this and if you think maybe that what I do here could be applied to something that you wish to do. Uh, I am interested in uh, in the future going more into uh, conservation biology. So so keep that in mind for uh, uh, for the future when I'm no longer a postdoc at UCCS. And thank you so much for listening. I'd uh, I'd love to try and answer some questions if you if you have any. Thank you very much, Jonas. This was a great talk, an amazing video. So I'm totally jealous. I can never show such great videos in my talks and I can completely appreciate the length of time that's been an amount of evidence put into digitizing these kind of videos and that amount of data. Uh, so yeah, great work uh, and really interesting research. So I'm going to open the floor to questions, but before I'm going to ask you all to ask, um, before I'm going to read other people's questions, I had my own question that I was wondering if you can answer. I'll try. And my personal interest is the impacts of climate change on uh, bats and biodiversity in general. And I wonder that given your experience with both aerodynamics, aeroacoustics, uh, whether you can give us some insights about how would expected uh, changes and the climate change affect uh, the aerodynamics and aeroacoustics of uh, both bats and the moth that they pursue. Yeah, so um, I... I don't know much about moths, um, but but we do know that that they move depending on on uh, on temperature, right? So um, the the work we're doing here will sort of map the the logic behind prey choice, right? You you hunt uh, a moth that that in your niche. So this means that as the as the moths get displaced um, because of the climate change, the bats will have to try and follow them. And if this results in moths moving to um, ecological um, uh, niches uh, that uh, the bats are less suited for, uh, we could see the, the bats get into trouble. So, so basically, our research will help predict how uh, we would expect bats to change their habitat a bit uh, to follow moth habitat. And that, that will, of course, lead to, to issues because bats have evolved in conjunction with these moths to specialize on certain moths, whereas the, the both moths have evolved to try and escape the, the, the bats. But uh, yeah, the, often the bats catch them in the end. So. I'm I'm rambling a bit, but do, do you sort of see what what I'm what I'm getting at? Yeah, definitely. It's really interesting to see these applications of the, this kind of research. Yeah, and and something related to is that um, one way that we tackle climate change is by moving to uh, to green energy forms. And one thing that we need to be mindful of there is that um, uh, that wind turbines can have a detrimental effect on on bats if they are placed in unwise areas or if uh, if the the wind turbines are uh, keeping um, active in regions of uh, in um, times of high bat activity so that's um, an, an an unfortunate area where one way in which we want to tackle climate change can have negative effects for another aspect of uh, of how climate change uh, uh, harms us all so that's bit of a tang tangent but that's uh, that's also an important area of research that uh, we do um, that my PI uh, and the master student Sera uh, Agababian does at uh, UCCS. Great thanks uh, we've got some questions here so we've got a question from uh, Rachel asking what challenges have you found with bats getting used to wind tunnels or to the flight uh, field flight uh, cages uh, or do they adapt quite quickly? Uh, in in my experience it, it differs quite a lot so the the nectivorous bats i guess maybe because they are so used to to flying at a stationary object they did very well in in a wind tunnel um it was very very relaxed work because you just put a feeder in there and wait for the bats to get hungry and go eat and then you could film and measure 
where's the uh, insectivorous bats that we focused on, the Placotus uh, auritus, the less uh, long-eared brown bat it's called in Swedish. I'm not sure about its common name in English. Uh, those were much more picky. You had to you had to put the grub, uh, the, the larvae in the right position and had to let go of the bat and sort of just the right way to be able to capture your data. And if you if you left them alone, they would just fly up in a corner and, and go to sleep more or less. So uh, that's, that's a difference between how they behave in, uh, in, in uh, wind tunnels, in, in my experience. And then in, in the wild, it's less about them becoming used to the flight arena. It's, I mean, there's some of that, but often it's just a case of some species and some individuals just seem to naturally do much better in uh, in, in a flight arena than others. And, and that is related to their ecological niche as well. The ones that thrive in cluttered environments where they hunt uh, moths in close quarters, they seem to do a bit better than, the, than, than for instance, the big brown bat or uh, even hoary bats where they, they did very poorly in the, in the flight arena. Thanks. We've got a question from Elena asking, um, some of our very small bats have creppy, I thought originally it was creepy, but it's actually creppy wings where the skin can stretch into a curve above the bones, like a tiny parachute between each finger. How does that affect the flight patterns? Oh, um, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm shooting from the hip a bit here, but typically, uh, typically all, all bats have uh, have some curvature going on where the where the the fingers uh, extend the skin, and this um, this uh, camber of the wing uh, in aerodynamic theory uh, predicts a higher lift force production. So it's in, in it's in a sense a, a way to um, so by increasing your your lift uh, coefficient, you can achieve as much lift at at, at lower speeds. So I, I would guess and, and be be mindful that I am guessing that wing uh, bats with a, a more, an extreme version of this are are probably specialized at flying quite slow and they use this uh, uh, extreme camber to uh, to be able to to stay aloft at at lower speeds with less uh, with less wing beats and less fast wing beats. Uh, but please. Uh, look that up uh, don't put that as a citation in a paper but that is my uh, intuitive uh, answer to that question well, that might be quite interesting bats to actually add to your flight cage experiments <laughs> oh i would love to so there is a question here also from martha asking have you thought about applying geometric morphometry instead of the formulas of wing loading and aspect ratio um i I have dabbled with that in in a course, but I applied the geometric. Uh, I, I, I forget what it's called. Um, I, I applied that to the the trajectories of the wings. So I compared that um, between individual bats of of the same species. I haven't done it over species, and um, but I would assume that that's a, that would be a very good method for for quantifying the morphological differences, rather than just going with these um, somewhat simple uh, morphological parameters that originate in, in in airplane theory. So I, I haven't done it, haven't thought too much about it in the last couple of years, but I think it's a it's a great idea and uh, actually something that I'll uh, I'll uh, make a note of and uh, bring up on the next lab meeting. Great, great to hear that uh, this is a two way thing. That also the questions are uh, uh, supporting you. Um, is there any other questions from the audience? While we're waiting for another question, I have a small question to ask, and I was quite perplexed by those very high values along the vertical roll angle of Amiotis auriculus. I wonder oh, if you yeah. have an explanation for that. I mean, I mean the, the explanation is just that they're, they're super agile. You, you'll see bats, um, you, you'll, you'll see them go completely vertical. And and you, you saw that there was sometimes more than a hundred degrees. So that's actually, that's actually a bat arcing, um, rolling more, more than vertical and uh, I, I I assume that that's 
often explained by the bat turn not being completely planar. So if you um, if you if you're turning in 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 a plane, so you're not going, you're not ascending or descending, you're not changing your height, then I would expect that the mat maximum roll angle that would make sense would be 90 degrees. Uh, for, for a short while, because you, you can't maintain that, because you'll if you put all your if you completely rotate your lift uh, vector, you'll, you'll lose height. But so uh, my assumption is that when they when they have a more angled turn, so when the the, the plane of the turn is isn't uh, horizontal, then I, I I expect that we we see those uh, extreme values a little bit more. So a more um, a more ex exotic turn. Which which these uh, these smaller bats uh, uh, are, are able to do in the flight arena. Great, thanks. Uh, yeah, good good to understand it, these fine differences and how these species are so flexible in a way in their flight performance. Y yeah, I I think going by what we've seen so far, I think what we'll find a lot of is redundancy. I think we'll find that bats are able to perform the same type of turn in very many different ways they have such a big uh, palette of, uh, of of techniques to to use while turning yeah and this is, i think it's it's a, it's a great quote um <laughs> actually to uh in a way um that to really understand the diversity of bats and uh, behavior yeah thanks yeah so if we don't have uh, any more questions what i'm left with is to if, I hope you can join me with uh, thanking Jonas for a really great talk and really, really interesting work. And uh, looking forward to hearing more about your work and especially about this paper coming up that um, currently uh, you're not allowed to tell us anything about. Yeah, yeah, next week. Brilliant. And uh, just to note that we'll be adding the video uh, to the YouTube channel for anyone who missed part of it or want to watch it anymore. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you all so much. Please, please uh, reach out if you if you want to ask me something or yeah anything like that thank you so much this has been uh, really fun